for the upper extremity uh, osteology, we'll start with the uh, scapula. And on the scapula, if we're looking at the posterior side, the first feature you're going to notice is the spine. Follow the spine all the way out, ends in this flat blade-like uh, process here called the acromion process. If we go below the spine of the scapula, this pocket here, this area is called the infraspinous fossa. If we go above the spine, this area up here is called the supraspinous fossa. If we flip the scapula over, so we're looking at the anterior side, then this entire surface here is the subscapular fossa. Going back over here, we want to look at the borders of the scapula. Um, this here would be the medial border of the scapula. This here would be the lateral border. If we follow the medial border all the way up to the top, we have what's called the superior angle. If we follow the inferior border all the way down to the bottom, we have what's called the inferior angle. Uh, looking up at the top of the scapula, we see along the upper border, we have this notch here called the scapular or sometimes called the suprascapular notch. Uh, if we turn the scapula, so we're looking at the lateral aspect, we can see here would be the glenoid fossa. At the very top would be the superglenoid tubercle. At the very bottom would be the infraglenoid tubercle. And then looking over here on the anterior side, we can see this process sticking out at us here, which would be the coronoid, uh, I'm sorry, the coracoid process. We also need to be able to orient the scapula, and in order to do that, for any of the bones um, that we're going to be doing, you want to find one feature that is either anterior or posterior, and then a separate feature that's either medial or lateral. In this particular case, you can use the spine of the scapula, it's easy to find, that is going to be posterior. And then you can either look at the acromion process, or if you want to find the glenoid fossa, and see that those, both of those features are going to point laterally, which means that this particular scapula would sit over here. Okay, this is going to be a right-handed scapula. Moving down into the humerus, um, here when you're looking at any of the long bones, there are going to be a couple, couple of common features. Uh, they're each, all the long bones are going to end in condylar surfaces. Here's a condyle, here's condyles down at the other end of the bone. They're all going to have shafts, which would be the body or, or the shaft of the bone. Um, looking at the humerus in particular here, if we start up at the proximal end, again, we have this proximal condyle of the humerus, and that's going to be called the head of the humerus. Uh, just past the head is where we're going to have the neck of the humerus. And then we're going to have these two prominences sticking out. Now this one's broken off just a little bit. This is a real bone, so it's it's broken just a touch in a couple of spots. But we have these two points sticking out here. This is going to be the lesser and greater tubercle of the humerus. In between the, the greater and lesser tubercles is going to be this groove here, and that's going to be called either the bicipital groove or the interturbicular groove. If we follow the greater tubercle down a little bit more distally, we find this bump here, which is going to be the deltoid tuberosity. Uh, if we follow the, the humerus down, the, we, again we said the main part is going to be the body or the shaft, and we come down towards the distal end of the humerus and we see that the humerus flares out here and here, and this is going to be the medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus serving as attachment points for most of the forearm muscles. Um, and then moving down a little bit further here at the distal end, we have the two condylar surfaces down here. and. Uh, we have two different names for these things. This one is called the trochlea, this area, and that's the area in which the ulna is going to articulate. And then this part of the condyle here is called the capitulum, and that's the area where the proximal end of the radius is going to articulate. We also have a couple of fossas down here, and the fossas uh, correspond to the processes on the ulna. So on the anterior side of the humerus here, this smaller fossa here is called the uh, coronoid fossa and on the posterior end of the distal end of the humerus, this fossa here is called the olecranon fossa. We need to be able to orient the humerus, and when we're looking at the humerus, uh, the features I usually look for are the head of the humerus will point uh, medially as it meets the glenoid fossa, um, and the other part that you want to look for that I usually find is at the distal end of the humerus, we find the olecranon fossa, and that points posteriorly. Okay, so that means that if I put out my arm like this, that this humerus would sit over on this side here, all right, which would make this a left-handed humerus. Moving down onto the ulna, here the one of the 
telltale signs of the ulna is going to be the C-shaped proximal end. Um, and those two processes sticking off here and here are going to be the olecranon process. The olecranon process will be this one, and the coronoid process will be that one. Here in between those will be the trochlear notch. That's what's going to articulate with the trochlear surface of the humerus. Um, over here, this little groove here is going to be the radial notch. That's where the radius is going to articulate with the ulna when we pronate and we supinate. Uh, moving down, here we have the anterior border of the ulna and on this side is where we're going to have the interosseous border and that's going to be relatively sharp. The interosseous membrane is going to connect there when it uh, attaches over to the radius. Moving down to the distal end of the ulna is where we're going to have the head of the ulna and then sticking off the head of the ulna you're going to have this little process which is just this little process which is just slightly broken off here which will be the styloid process of the ulna. When you're trying to orient the ulna, um, you want to again look for something that's either anterior or posterior or something that's medial or lateral. And in this particular case, we're going to look for the, the olecranon process and the coronoid process. Both of them are going to face anteriorly. Let's just hold the, the bone this way to make it a little easier for us. Um, both of these are going to point anteriorly. And the other thing we want to note is that the notch for the radius is going to point laterally. So that means that this particular ulna would sit like this over on this side. The other thing you could possibly look for too is that the styloid process is going to be uh, medial at that point. So this would be a right-handed ulna. It wouldn't sit like that. Moving down to the radius here. Um, let's turn this around. So we're looking at the radius. We have uh, the proximal end of the radius here would be called the head of the radius. Uh, and here we're going to have the capitular surface, which is going to artic articulate with the capitulum. We have this little point sticking off here, which will be the radial tuberosity. Uh, as we go down, we have the anterior border of the radius here. And again, we have a sharp edge like we did on the ulna there, which will be the interosseous border. Moving down to the distal end of the radius, here um, we can see if we stand this up here that we have a point sticking out the distal end that's going to be the styloid process of the radius. And then on the posterior side of the distal end of the radius, you see we have a couple of ridges and valleys here. And that's where some of the tendons on the posterior side of your wrists are going to pass through these ridges um, on the posterior distal end of the radius. If we want to orient the radius, let's turn this around again so we can uh, oriented a little bit better. What I usually look for is um, you can either look for the radial tuberosity or you can look for the styloid process at the end of the radius. The styloid process is going to point laterally. The radial tuberosity of the radius is going to point medially. So either one of those you can use. And then if you look down at the distal end of the radius, the anterior side is going to be uh, kind of have a, a depression here where the posterior side is going to have those ridges and valleys that we identified. Um, so that means if we, if we put those things in their proper positions that the radius, this particular radius would sit like this on this side. Okay, so this is going to be a right-handed radius. Looking at the hand, here we have the, the carpal bones and starting over on the thumb side we have the trapezium, then next to that we have the trapezoid, then here we have the capitate, here we have the hamate, those are the, the first row that are right up against the metacarpals. And then the second row, we have, starting over on the thumb side again, we have the scaphoid, we have the lunate, we have the triquetrum, and the pisiform. Okay? And then the two parts you want to note here are the hook of the hamate, which is here, and the tubercle of the trapezium, and that's where the flexor retinaculum is going to connect to to close off the, the carpal tunnel in that area. Moving down a little bit, here we have the metacarpals. And you have first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. First going to the thumb, fifth going to the little finger. Um, and then down beyond that, we have the phalanges. And going to the thumb, we just have a proximal and a distal phalange. Um, going out to each one of the fingers here, we have a proximal, a middle, and a distal phalange. Now for uh, the metacarpals and all of the parts of the phalanges, they have common parts here. All right, the more proximal end is called the base. The middle of it is called the shaft, and the distal end is called the head, and that's going to follow for the metacarpals, for the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges of each one of the digits.
Looking down at the lower extremity osteology, um, we're going to start with the coxal bones. So we'll look at one half of the coxal bones over here. Um, and the first thing you want to note is that the coxal bones are actually made up of three separate bones. So each half is made up of three separate bones. So if we start in the hip socket here, which is called the acetabulum. The acetabulum is where the three bones come together. Uh, so the socket is, is formed by all three of those bones. Um, the most a uh, superior one and the largest of the three here is going to be the ilium. All right, so that's going to make up most of the top of the hip socket. The most inferior one down here is going to be the ischium that makes up most of the inferior part of the hip socket. And then the more medial bone over here is going to be the pubis bone and that makes up part of the medial aspect of the hip socket. Um, if we start up on the ilium, we find that the top of the ilium here is called the iliac crest. And if we follow the crest, um, out to the ends, we see that the, on the anterior side, that the iliac crest ends in what's called the anterior superior iliac spine. And then just inferior to that, we have another bump here called the anterior inferior iliac spine. If we go back up to the crest and follow that to the posterior side, we see that the posterior end ends in what's called the posterior superior iliac spine. And then you move just inferior to that and you have the posterior inferior iliac spine. Also on the ilium, we have some surfaces. The external surface of the ilium in this area is called the gluteal surface of the ilium. If we turn this around so we're looking at the inside of the ilium, and here this is called the iliac fossa, or the iliac surface. Okay, so gluteal surface or fossa out here, and then iliac fossa on the inside. Um, here you can see on the ilium, right where I'm sticking the probe here is in between the ilium and the sacrum and that's going to be the auricular surfaces so both the sacrum and the ilium are going to have what's called an auricular surface and that's where those two spots articulate with each other at the sacroiliol joint. If we move down here over towards the pubis bone on the top of the pubis bone right here is where we're going to have the pubic tubercle okay and we can see that in between the two halves of the pubis bone there's usually a fibrous piece of tissue in here which would be called the where the pubic symphysis is um, and then on the pubis bone here we have rami we have a superior pubic ramus and an inferior pubic ramus reaching out to join um, the ilium and then down to join the ischium if we move over onto the ischium over here the very bottom of the ischium is where we're going to find the ischial tuberosity here we have the body of the ischium up here and then we have a ramus of the ischium going out towards the pubis bone over here. So the inferior pubic ramus and the ischial ramus join together here. Um, and between those two bones, between the pubis bone and the ischium and the acetabulum up here, we form this opening called the obturator foramen. Moving over here, looking at, at this aspect of the um, ischium, again, here's the ischial tuberosity down here. We have this point sticking out here, which is going to be the ischial spine. The ischial spine divides two notches this one here being the greater sciatic notch and this one here being the lesser sciatic notch. Um, we also have some ligaments in our body that connect the sacrum to the ischium. Um, that's going to be the sacrospinous ligament going from the sacrum to the ischial spine and the sacrotuberous ligament going from the sacrum down to the ischial tuberosity. And we can see if I use my fingers to kind of create those two ligaments like that, that we're going to create some openings here. And the greater sciatic notch here with the help of the ischial, um, the sacrospinous uh, ligament is going to form the greater sciatic uh, foramen. And then in between the sacrospinous and the sacrotuberous ligament down here in the lesser sciatic notch over here is going to form the lesser sciatic foramen. Moving down, here we have uh, a femur, and we look, we start at the proximal end of the femur, and here we see um, the proximal condyle here called the head of the femur. Next to that, right here is where we have the neck of the femur. And just past that, we have two large prominences here. This is going to be the greater and lesser trochanters of the femur. Now on this side, we have a ridge that connects these two things. That's called the intertrochanteric ridge. That's going to be on the posterior side of the femur. And if we go over to the anterior side, there's going to be a line that connects those two spots, which will be called the intertrochanteric line. So again, this would be greater and lesser trochanters of the femur. Follow the femur down. This main part is called the body or the shaft. And if we look on the posterior border, Along this same spot is where we have a line going down here, which will be called the linea aspera. 
Also, here would be the linea aspera. Over here, we're going to have another line called the pectineal line. Follow the femur down to the distal end, and in this area, this surface here is going to be called the popliteal surface of the femur. And if we look down at the distal end, we have two condyles down here. We have a, a medial and a lateral condyle. And then we have an intercondylar fossa in between there. Uh, going back over to the anterior side, we see that the bone flares out at the ends, and that's where we're going to have the medial and lateral epicondyles of the femur. Now, the medial side and the lateral side have a little bit of the bone worn away, but you can still kind of see where that would have been here. So, medial and lateral epicondyles. And then the last thing we have is in between the two condyles on the anterior side is where we have the patellar surface of the femur, and that's where the patella is going to slide. Uh, in order to orient, in order to orient the femur, uh, you'll want to find something that's medial and lateral. Easiest thing to use is the head of the femur up here, which is going to point medially. And then you need to find something that's anterior or posterior. So in this particular case, you can use the linea aspera, which is always going to be posterior. So if we move out a little bit, we take this femur. This femur is going to sit on this side over here, so it's going to be a right-handed femur. Uh, the next thing we want to look at here is going to be the tibia. And here, looking at, let's do it this way, looking at the proximal end of the tibia, here we have the condyles, and this end here is going to be the medial, and this here is going to be the lateral condyle of the tibia. We have these parts sticking up in between. These are the intercondylar eminences in between the two condyles. This is where your ACL and your PCL are going to attach to. If we look around on the anterior side, we have this large knob here, which will be called the tibial tuberosity. That's where the, uh, patellar, ten, or the patellar ligament or the quadriceps ligament attaches to. Following down, we see that this here is called the anterior crest of the tibia. It's relatively sharp. Uh, moving down towards the distal end, we can see that this piece sticking down over here is going to be the medial malleolus of the tibia. Here we have the, the fibula, and you want to be able to identify the proximal end of the fibula, which we call the head of the fibula. That articulates over here with the proximal lateral side of the tibia. And then here we have the body and the shaft of the fibula, and then we move all the way down to the distal end, and right here is where we have the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Looking down at the foot here, um, first we want to identify the tarsal bones. We have two relatively large tarsal bones, the more superior of those being the talus, the more inferior of those being the calcaneus. Here we can see how the talus sits on top of the calcaneus, calcaneus being your heel bone. Then if we come out anterior to those, we can see coming off the talus, we have this bone here, which would be called the navicular bone. Coming off of the calcaneus, we have this one here called the cuboid bone. And then off of the uh, navicular bone, we have the first, second, and third cuneiform bones. Uh, attached to those, off of the first, second, and third cuneiform and the cuboid bone here, uh, we have the metatarsals. Right? And then we have one, two, three, four, five metatarsals. First one going to the big toe, the fifth one going to the little toe. Then off the end of the metatarsals here, we have the phalanges. And for the four toes, we're going to have a proximal, a middle, and a distal phalange. Uh, and for the, the big toe, the hallux, we're just going to have a proximal and a distal phalange. Each one of those bones, the metatarsals and the phalanges, all, all of the uh, parts of the phalanges here, are, are going to have similar parts. The proximal end is going to be called um, the base. The middle part here is called the shaft, and the distal end is called the head.